I share with you this morning that we're going to trust God, whether it's riches or ruin, good or bad, life or death, whatever may come. I tried to find, you know, I, I thought I don't want to bore the people to death with all these, you know, exact opposites, if you will. But I want you to understand what that means. People get married today, and one of the vows that's normally in every wedding is for better or for worse, richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. And nobody means it. Well, I know we did. Glory. Give her a gold star. She's the only one that agreed to that. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. The fact of the matter is, is that many people today won't get married without a prenuptial agreement. And as Tiger Woods found out, that don't mean nothing. Amen. He learned real quick. He thought his multiplied million dollar empire was safe, but honey, he messed up. He really messed up. And I don't want any bad on him or anybody else for that fact, but the fact of the matter is, I wonder about people who marry only for the looks. You know what I'm saying? Oh, they've got the trophy wife. They've got the Adonis husband. And then the enemy strikes. And it seems like their love goes out the window. But I've purposed in my heart with the Lord. And I've told him this different times, various times, at different seasons in our life, whether it was good or whether it was bad. God, I'm in for the long haul. Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Nevertheless, blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus was faced the night before his crucifixion, there crying out to the Father in the Garden of Eden, praying to the point that his sweat became as great drops of blood, and scientists tell us and, and medical experts say it's because the amount of stress in his body was so intense. Knowing what he was facing, that once his sweat glands had literally, literally absolved himself of every drop of sweat, the capillaries up under the skin burst because of the pressure he was under to allow the release of the heat in his body because he was under such stress. And he cried out, Oh, Father, if there's any way that this cup might pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, yours be done the truth of the matter is if you live long enough there will be a time in your life when you are overwhelmed amen brother Nolan there will be times that come in your life I pray they are few and very far between but there will be times that things come and when they do what do you do when you get overwhelmed? Look with me to the book of Psalms, if you would. Psalm 143. Psalm 143. And take a look at verses 3 and 4, and then verse 7 and 8. The whole psalm is worthy of reading, but tonight, just for the sake of this message, I want to read verse 3 and 4. If you've got it, say amen. Psalm 143, here we go. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Now you've got to understand when he wrote this, when the psalmist wrote this, the resurrected, or, or excuse me, the righteous soul of men and women went to a compartment in hell. I believe it was paradise. I believe it was there that they were comforted by none other than Father Abraham himself. And the Word of God tells us that in the book of Luke where Jesus tells about the rich man who died and in his eyes lifted his eyes up in hell. 
But he's saying very clearly that when someone's long been dead, waiting for the resurrector, waiting for the resurrection, waiting for him who is the life and resurrection. Hallelujah. He said, therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. Skip down to verse 7. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Have you ever been there? You ever been there where you just, I, I, I'm, about, I'm, about to, I'm about to give in. I'm about to, it's more than I can bear. Don't hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Rather cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. For in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk. For I lift my soul to you. I just want to, for a few moments here, share with you what to do when you're overwhelmed. I want nothing but good for you in 2022. I want everything to be peachy keen. I want it to be roses without thorns, peaches without fuzz. Amen. But if you should happen to find yourself in a similar situation that the psalmist speaks of, this is what you do when you get overwhelmed. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, open our hearts up tonight, God. Your word is replete, O oh God, Lord, with all of the things that, Father, you've promised for us. With all of those promises, God, surely we must understand how blessed we are. As I said a while ago, we truly are the apple of your eye because we are your children. Though we are adopted in, yet we can cry out because of the Holy Spirit, Abba, Father. And I thank you for that, God. I'm so glad, God, I'm not just a, a, a servant being, oh God, Lord of a great and almighty God. But Father, I thank you that I am one of your own and you call me precious you call me blessed you call me son and I thank you for that Lord when the times come in this life that my flesh is overwhelmed God my spirit is bent low when I feel like God I'm not going to make it help me to realize that I can turn to you and you are the lifter of my head in Jesus' holy name I pray and everybody said Amen and amen and amen. Sometimes life just gets tough. Kind of like the truck driver that pulled into a local roadside eatery. And when he got there, he noticed all these motorcycles from a gang that had pulled in there. He walked inside, not being a whole lot to look at himself. But you could tell he was a man that had some mileage on him. Got in there and he sat down trying not to bother anybody. And before long, a bully within the biker gang came up and began to harass him and they began to pick at him and begin to do stuff to him and finally he paid his bill left a tip for the waitress and out the door he went and one of the bikers was overheard to say well he wasn't much of a man he didn't even offer any kind of resistance whatsoever and the waitress spoke up and said he wasn't much of a driver either he ran over everybody's bikes on the way out Sometimes you just have to wait to know when to take advantage of the enemy. Sometimes you just need to know when it's the right time. Amen. You may not be able to stand up to every bully, but praise God when the time is right. Praise God you can take them down. I love boxing. I know I'm not the only person in here. I, I, I understand Sister Maggie just loves to watch boxers go at it. And it's just powerful to see them duking it. I'm kidding, Sister Maggie. Don't worry. Hallelujah. She looked at me like, say what? You know. But I know I've got some other boxing fans here. There's nothing worse than I hate to see is that when they're getting ready to you know, go to the ring and everything, and you have one boxer that's cocky and arrogant and just the kind of person you want to take out back and whoop real good you know, while nobody's looking. And that person gets in the ring and, oh, they think they've got it all worked out and they're dancing around doing all their stuff and they're, be, you know, they're just doing all kinds of stuff. And then it happens. The guy that they've been ridiculing, the guy he's been putting down, the guy that he's been just, just being a, just a, a jerk to, all of a sudden he gets that one shot. 
And Mr. Cocky Arrogant is, is suddenly finding himself on, on, on rubber legs. And he can't stand up straight. And that's when I jump to my feet. I confess, man, when I get in it, I get in it. I'm on my feet. Hit him. Hit him again. Don't let him get out of this round, you know. And I can watch a match and I can pretty much tell you when it's lost and when it's won. I can tell you when it's reached a point of no return. And I've been wrong a time or two. But I can tell you this much, friend. It seems like you're down sometimes and the enemy's got you right where he wants you. He's getting ready to deliver the final blow. Anybody ever see the Cinderella man? You know what I'm talking about. Based on the true story, I'm here to tell you the, the champion was coming in for the kill. He'd already killed one boxer by coming in from the side and hitting him with a downward glancing blow. And when he did so, he hit him so hard he dislodged his brain inside of his skull and he died there in the ring. The way they played it up, Ron Howard, you remember him, Opie from Mayberry. He was the director of this. And the way he played it up is that it was all set up for this guy to do it one more time. Max Bear, the father of Max Bear Jr., you remember Jethro. Man, I'm going to have to do some real work with some of y'all. I could hear like, you mean Jethro from the Bible? No. I mean Jethro from the Beverly Hillbillies. His daddy was the guy that was that cocky, arrogant boxer. And lo and behold, he's got, he's got him set up. He's got the challenger who's had to work his way from, I mean, down below the bottom to be there in the ring contending for the heavyweight championship of the world. He's got him beat down. And he's over there in the corner, and he's watching, and he's watching. And he can see out of the corner of his eye. Here he comes. Here he comes. He's setting up. He's getting ready to deliver that final blow like he did about three boxers ago. Lo and behold, at the last moment, he pulls up. The champion misses it. When he did, the guy that they said didn't have a chance, the Cinderella man, came up and hit him and knocked him backwards. And he couldn't see straight what was going on. And before it was over, said and done, they went to the cards. But the Cinderella man won. And I'm here to tell you, sometimes that's the way the devil looks at me and you. We don't stand a snowball's chance in August in the middle of Miami in the summertime. But I'm here to tell you, God says, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what they can do to me. And God will help us and see us through and bring us forth with our hands raised in victory because he's never lost a battle. And the battle is the Lord's. Five things. I want to share them with you tonight, if I can, real quick. If you're making notes, go with me here. If you would, first and foremost, you need to understand that God has a plan for you. You need to be aware that the Bible is very clear to us. One of the most well-known scriptures in the last two generations is this scripture here. Jeremiah 29 and 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. God's plan for you is a future and a hope. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. You need to understand God's plan is very simply twofold. He's going to give you a future. Some people don't believe they have a future. We came through a period of time that they tell us while well, everybody's making merry and being happy because it's the Christmas season and the New Year's. There's all these people that are depressed and down in the dumps. And let me tell you, you need to read 29 and 11 again. God's got a future for you. God's got a hope for you. You're not hopeless. You're hopeful. You're not without a future. God's got something planned. If you will turn to him because God's plans do not fail. God's plans succeed. God's plans come through when they're needed the most. Somebody say amen. amen. Second thing that you need to be aware of is that God, no matter what your storm may be, God will calm your storm. I kept waiting for the thunder last night. I never heard it. I'm not saying it didn't. I just never heard it. I kept thinking, man, this is all we need. Three o'clock in the morning, sound asleep. All this stuff comes through thunder and lightning and wind blowing and possibility of tornadoes. And they kept moving this little bubble up on the map that they kept showing us with the weather channel and everything. I thought, dear Lord, you've got to do something. You've got to help us. Well, God did something. God came in last night and calmed it all down. We got the rain, thank God. There's a river again out there that I get to cross now. Before it was just a creek, but now it's a river again. Thank you, Lord. 
Lord. I went past another place where there was a body of water, and man, it's so full that I think it hadn't got to where I cross over yet. It's making its way through all the bends and the curves and everything. But once it gets there, we're going to see that God has blessed us with a rain again. He's caused it to rain upon us again. Somebody say amen. He's brought it back to us and filled up the water table again. I'm so glad that he's done it. God has a plan. But friend, when you have a storm, what are you going to do? Well, let me tell you what God will do. Second of all, God will calm your storm. God will absolutely bring calm to your storm. In Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35, the Bible says, On the same day when Jesus was teaching the people, using parables and ministering to them and healing everybody that came before him, he literally on that same day when evening had come said to his disciples, Let us cross over to the other side. And when they left the multitudes behind, they took him along in the boat just like he was. I got through preaching this morning. I was soaking wet. There wasn't a dry spot on my coat. There was my shirt, my undershirt, my socks. I think even my toes were wet. It was, I'm, I was so clean to the bone this morning when I got through preaching. Y'all look dry as all get out, but I was soaking wet. They took Jesus just like he was. Maybe covered with some of the dry blood from people that he had rebuked the flow of blood in their bodies. He, he was taken just as he was, maybe with some of the flakes of dead skin that had come off the lepers. He was taken just as he was, literally taken out of the, uh, if you will, the, the, the very tunnel and the very traps of sin that had tried to come in there and show him up. And yet he showed up sin by taking care of it all for those people that day. They took him as he was, put him in the boat, and they started to the other side. Other little boats began to follow them. They wanted to see what Jesus was going to do on the other side. I don't know about you. I don't care about what Jesus just does here. I want to know what God is doing out there as well. I want to be a part of what God's doing out there and not just what's going on. Shout with me any time now. Don't worry. I'll keep you as long as you want to be kept. Some of you are like, he's going to be finished in just a couple of minutes. No, he's not. These other little boats were people that represent churches that are too small for the rest of the world to acknowledge or pay any attention to. Those little boats were in the eyesight of Jesus. Finally, Jesus, the flesh of Jesus, had gotten so weak from doing all that he did. He had went, gone and got in the back part of the little boat, and there he went to sleep. When a sudden storm broke free, when it did, it turned a peaceful, calm sea of Galilee into an absolute washout. They're bailing, they're grabbing lines, they're rowing, they're, they're crying, they're praying, they're doing everything. And finally somebody goes to the stern of the ship and finds Jesus asleep on a pillow. I don't blame him. Some days you just got to take a nap. Thank you. Don't look at me like I did something wrong. I so wore out when I got home. Diane said, what's wrong with you? I said, baby, I'm tired. I said, I preached my heart out. And I thought I did for a little bit because it felt like there wasn't nothing in there. Jesus took a nap there in the back and they came and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He cares. He cares. You want to know why he cares? Because it's you. And that's it. It's you. He cares about you. He loves you. He sees you. And when you're in distress, it troubles him. So he takes a nap. Why? Because he knows everything's under control. Everything's going to be all right. We would do well to take notice of what Jesus does. Jesus took a nap because everything's going to be all right. But for their sake, he got up, stood up, walked over to the side and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Yeah, if I was Presbyterian, I'd believe that. My good friend, Brother Gary, who pastored a Presbyterian church, he would laugh when I would say that. He said, be a Presbycostal. I said, what do they sound like? He said, peace, be still. That's the way Jesus said it. He wanted the storm to know he knew who he was talking to. He knew who he was addressing. He didn't mess with the devil. He didn't get into conversation with the devil. He just told him what needed to happen. And as soon as Jesus said, peace be still, the Bible said that the wind ceased and the sea was 
calm. Somebody say amen. I don't mean in a couple of days. I don't mean in a few hours. I'm talking about right then, right there. His word was able to cause the sea to become calm and the winds to stop blowing and the storm from storming. He took care of the situation right then and right there. Amen, Brother Nolan. Thank you, Brother Paul. Why are you so fearful, he said. Or in other words, why are you so full of fear? We pray for people half-heartedly. We pray for people half-cocked. We pray for people and don't really mean what we're praying for. Sometimes we just pray for people without really praying for the need. Don't look at me like that. It's true. I believe if we're going to pray, pray. Get these requests on Facebook. Pray for this one. Pray for that one. I don't wait and go do it sometime later when it's convenient. I stop what I'm doing. You've seen it. I type it in right then and there. I go ahead and pray. I put up a prayer right then and there. I've been contacted by different people. Why do you do that? Well, I thought it was a pretty serious need at the moment. If you need help then and there, you don't need to wait for somebody 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour and a half later to pray. You need to get a hold of God. And let me tell you, friend, God can answer a heartfelt prayer typed out in Facebook as quick as he can. Somebody waiting till it's a more convenient time to pray. Preach, Brother Nolan. I believe I will. If you're going to pray, pray. I love what T.O. Lowry did. Lady walked up to him on a plane. They're flying. She said, you look so familiar to me. May I ask you what your name is? He said, T.L. Lowry. I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, he would have said, I am T.L. Lowry, and I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, I remember you. I remember going to a tent meeting that you did when I was a little girl. I remember going to a camp meeting where you were the guest speaker. Yes, yes, I did those things. She said, Brother Lowry, can I ask you to please pray for me? She said, this is a hard job that I've got. I know people don't think it is, but it is. And she said, it's almost unbearable at times. And I need a better job. And I need better pay. You think God cares about that? Oh, sister, God cares for you. She said, well, would you please pray for me? He said, you mean now? Apparently, she didn't remember everything from those past meetings. She said, okay. He jumped up and said, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And out she fell. People are looking at TL. Some are going like this, you know, trying to get themselves prepared. She was just coming to herself when they landed. She was met by the supervisor of flight attendants. They took her to the side and informed her she needed to clean her personal belongings out. She was fired for unbecoming conduct. T.L. tried to put in a word. It didn't seem to matter. Didn't know anything more about it. Weeks went by until this young lady stepped up to him who looked somewhat familiar. Oh, Brother Lowry, let me tell you what happened. She said, when you laid your hands on me and the Lord knocked me out in the Holy Ghost, it's the greatest thing that could have ever happened. She said, I gave my heart and my life back to God. I said, God, if I have to roam the streets and live homeless, I'll do it as long as you don't take away the peace that I feel in my heart. Lo and behold, she Didn't know it, but her story got out to other airlines. And one of the other supervisors of the airline stewardesses called her in and said, I understand you were relieved of duties. Can you tell me why? And she said, yeah, I'll tell you why. And she told her why. She said, oh, praise the Lord. She said, I've been looking for somebody like you. She goes, excuse me. She said, I'm spirit filled. I've been blood washed. I'm a child of God. And I want to put nothing but children of God in this very airline. She said, would you like a job? She said, sure. She said, what hours can you work? She said, I really would like to be available some Sundays if you don't mind. I understand how this works and I can't have them all off, but as many as I can. She said, you'll have three a month off. 
She got herself involved in church. They hired her and gave her more pay than she was getting with the other lines. And I'm here to tell you straight up, friend, she became so much happier in what the devil thought he was going to really embarrass her over. God took that decision. The devil meant it for her evil, but God turned it around for her good. You're not hearing what I'm saying. I'm telling you, God will calm your storm if you'll let him. Third thing you need to know, God can redirect your course when you get off course. Do you understand that the Bible is clear to us in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge Him. And He'll do what? He shall direct your path. Don't know which way to go? God does. He's got the map already laid out, and the only path for you to take is the one that God's laid out for you. Like, I'm believing God. What we prayed this morning for Jennifer, God's got a road map for her. It takes her right to the place she needs to go, right to the person she needs to see to get the job she's asked him for. Amen! I'm here to tell you, friend, it's time to stop just praying to get them out the door. It's time to pray until they hit the floor. Shout with me, why don't you? Amen. My God, you need to understand that if you'll do what Proverbs says, we've got to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, not part of our heart. Not with, just with some of our heart. Some people want to get a new job and God offers to do them, but it's not perfect because they don't have their days off. Friend, take the days off you can get. Like that lady who was a flight attendant. Trust him. God will redirect your course. Do you know that when they go up in space, and here's one of the problems that came up last week, I believe it was last week, Elon Musk took all kinds of heat over it because they didn't properly check all the avenues that were going on up in the space heavens, if you will. Shot off one of their deals to help out the rocket race that's going on right now. And almost hit the Chinese space station. You know what we need up there? We need some red lights. They know, need to know when to stop and when to go. Because apparently Elon Musk says, I'm going. I don't care what it says. I've talked with the soldiers that would come back with the 101st Airborne there in Clarksville, Tennessee. They said, we tried once or twice to drive while we were there in Afghanistan. You're taking your life in your own hand. I said, oh, you mean because the other people around you are, are, are loaded with all kinds of machine guns and, and uh, you know, all kinds of weaponry? Oh, no, no. We're talking about there ain't no stop signs. There ain't no red lights there. There isn't any patrol cops. You just get out there and hope and pray for the best. Listen. If I get into a bump car at the fair, that's one thing. But when they're playing bump cars for real in life, I want to stay in the room. Somebody help me here. Amen. God lets the people. God has shown through his word how that NASA, whenever they send up something into space, they are constantly checking the course. They're constantly checking to make sure they're on course. And if they get off course, they have to alter their course to get themselves they said if they had messed up with the guys going to the moon that they absolutely would have been all kinds of trouble if they had been off by just a half of a degree they could have missed the moon by hundreds of thousands of miles you and I do good to get down to food city and back fourth thing you need to understand you need to take a spirit of forgiveness Oh, not about you, but about those around you. Some people need forgiving more than you realize. And you need to remember that if Christ forgave you, you also ought to forgive. That's hard, isn't it? Come on, don't look at me like that. Yeah, hey, brother, no, you don't know who I'm dealing with. You're right, and I'm glad. And if you introduce me to them, I promise you I will forgive them at some point. But the fact of the matter is, when I think about how many times I tread upon those areas before God, and I had to seek forgiveness. So I, I'm just going to tell you straight up, I, I'm not 100% dead on about being a, a, a heavenly guide. 
No, I can get us there. But I may have some issues along the way. And one of those things I have to deal with is people who aren't as saved as I am. Don't look at me like that. You've got to deal with people that aren't as saved as you are. I've had to come to the reality that I, I, I think that, well, there isn't anything I can preach that they haven't already heard. But the fact of the matter is, there isn't everybody in our community that knows what you and I know. Are you hearing me? And what you know puts you so many steps ahead of them. And so many different levels above them. Not that that makes you better than them, but simply put, friend, there's more in you than you're aware of what God has done. How God has shown you His grace and His mercy and His love. And there's one thing you can do is even when somebody messes up, forgive. Forgive for Christ's sake. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Look at it here. Listen. Let all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another. Tender heart. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The fifth and final thing that you need to do when you feel overwhelmed is what the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Very simply, you need to come to the realization that the Lord is always with you. He's not just with you on Sunday morning. He's not just with you when you're in church or at church events. He's with you always. He's with you always. He's with you always. He's with you always. I always, you know, when somebody's having surgery and it's been so hard this past couple of years because of the COVID situation, they won't let me into hospitals sometimes and other times. We can walk right in. You try to go, I'm sorry, but unless you're an immediate family member and only one of you can go in. Well, I hope to God the one that goes in knows Jesus. But here's what I know. If the one that I want to pray for knows Jesus, he's already there. I send up a prayer and it goes right to his ear and he hears what I pray for them. You're hearing what I'm saying? We just, oh, Brother Nolan, it's so important for you to be there. Can I tell you, it's so important for the Lord to be there. I'm one thing. He's a whole other. Hallelujah to God. I, I want you to know that our God that we love so much is able to touch on the other side of the world. My last trip into Cuba, I got scared coming out. I wasn't sure I was coming out. I thought, Lord, I wonder if they allow visitation at the Great Bar Hotel. All because of a guitar. I saw that guitar today. Pastor Esley was not there in the service with them today. Brother Angel Garcia or someone else had charge of the service. And Brother Esley has been playing the keyboard for them. I didn't even know he could play. Brother Victor, who had played when we were there, is, is touring the nation and, and uh, Cuba and other places with a gospel group singing and glorifying God. Brother Angel... I'd played that guitar as well as I could, and I thought, wow, this sounds like a cheap toy. Turned it over to Brother Angel, and he started doing that, that Caribbean, you know. And I'm like, holy mackerel. They'd already told me, when you come back to the airport, that guitar had better be with you, or you're going to pay the value of that guitar. And I was thinking, okay, I, I, I've got $120 that I can part with and still get back to America on. And I thought, no, I don't either. And, and the night before we were to leave, we got together and I was playing the guitar. We were singing some of the old red back hymnal songs. And Sister uh, Betty was there and she was just rejoicing and loving what God was doing. And it was so wonderful. And Brother Angel said, do you mind if I play? He speaks English as well. No, sure, here, go ahead. He tuned it a little bit. And, blah, 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 and I'm like, 
Oh, that guitar's not going back to Tennessee. I can tell you that right now. I saw him today playing that guitar as they worship God in a full house there in Havana, Cuba. And I rejoiced because we were a part of that. We're, that, that was a gift to them, and they're still using that guitar. And I need to send him some strings if I can figure out how to do that. You know, I'm sure they're needing to be replaced after three years. But the fact of the matter is I rejoiced over the fact that we were a part of that. And in that time when I absolutely didn't know what was going to happen, as they took me before the sergeant major is what I call this lady because, oh my gosh, she took out my, she took out my, 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 uh, uh, that thing, yeah. Thank you. Finally, you've helped me. Didn't get ahead of me. She took my passport. She looked at the picture and she looked at me. Then she pulled her glasses down and she still looked at me through the glasses, convinced that I was the person in the picture. She let me go. She did the same thing to my interpreter. We got through and they let us back and they took us back. And they took us, I'm convinced they took us to places back there up under the airport that tourists don't see. And in my mind, I can hear the ABC commentator going, Paul thought he was going on a leisurely missionary trip to Cuba. Then it happened. Dun, dun, dun. You know, they're never going to hear from me again. There was, no, there was no signal for cell service there. There was no way to get a note out. There was no way to tell anybody where we were at. And they weighed me and they weighed the guitar and they weighed me and the guitar like that it was going to change. And finally, they took me back to a little... Bullet free zone had to be, even though they still had bulletproof glass on the walls there. And the lady, she said, Where is the guitar? This is in, now she's speaking Spanish, and my interpreter's telling me. And he's trying to explain to her a gift. How do you tell people about a gift when they don't understand the term gift? Finally, he explained that the guitar was purchased for this church. That our church wanted to bless their church with this musical instrument so they could have it for their worship services. I saw her shaking her head. It just didn't make sense. What idiot comes into Cuba to bring gifts? You're supposed to buy our stuff and take it back home to America. I did. Not that much, but I did. Finally, she gets through. I don't know what she looked at. She goes, that's $85 and a nico. I said, American or Cuban? Don't joke with them. I really wasn't joking, but I, I had both. I had a nickel in Cuban finance, and I had a nickel in American. She goes, American. And I pulled out $85 and a nickel in American and I gave it to her. And she gave me a receipt. Go. I thought, all right, praise God. I had to stop. And they weighed me again. I guess they could see I was $85 and a nickel lighter than I was before the first time I came through. We got through there. Made our way back to Sergeant Major. I was so happy when they finally let us go. They took us back upstairs. I had to go back through all the screening process, take my shoes off, take my belt off, hold my pants up. I wear a belt for a reason. Not to be fashionable. It really does hold my britches up. I don't know about you. And we got through there. And let me tell you, I, though I was unnerved, shall we say, I knew that God had not forgotten us, nor had God forsaken us, but God was with us every step of the way. And I felt really, really good when that plane finally pulled off at the end of the air, the, the tarmac, and we got up into the air, and we're headed north by northwest, going up to Miami, and I rejoiced. I did what everybody else did when we landed in Miami. I went like this. I asked the question, why do they do that? They're so happy that they landed safely at either location. Thank you, Jesus, for never leaving me nor forsaking me. 
The Bible is clear to us. In Deuteronomy 31 and 6, the Bible says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. Let me say that again. He is the one who goes with you. He is the one who goes with you. Thank God. God, I think I get in my truck by myself, but Jesus is there with me. I think I go to places that have me a little unnerved, but Jesus is right there with me. He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Here it is again, in case you missed any of them. Number one, you need to, when you get overwhelmed, remember that God has a plan for you. Number two, you need to realize that God will calm your storm no matter what that storm may be. Number three, God will redirect your course when you get off course. Number four, forgive others as Christ forgave you. And number five, never forget that God is always with you. This coming year, I love to be able to tell you The third week of January, this is going to happen. The second week of February, this is going to take place. And before your birthday happens in March, this is going to go down. But I don't know any of that, not unless God shows me. But here's what I know. My God will be with us every step of the way, good or bad. Amen? Whether it's rich or ruined. Whether it's life or death, God will be with us every step of the way. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, help us. I've come to the realization of these things, these promises, oh God, Lord, these guiding posts in my life. And I thank you, God, that as an old man, God, I've learned them and learned them well. And there are times, God, that people don't understand why I'm so calm and why ain't I upset about this or that or the other. Because, God, you've got it. You knew it before it would take place. You understood what would happen if I went this way or that way, if I decided rightly or wrongly. So, God, I thank you, Father, that you've got a plan for me, whether I'm right where I need to be or I need a little alteration to get me where I need to be. I pray God touch our church this year. Help us as we endeavor over the next 12 months, God, Lord, to do everything we can do in 2022. And help us, God, the things that we do, let it be, God, for the sake of the kingdom. Let it be, oh God, Lord, I pray, Father, for the sake of souls being added to the kingdom. And help us to be found working until Jesus comes for your glory, for our good, for somebody's eternal soul's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.